Hello. Here's a funny story from a job I used to have. I was working at a tech company where I had access to a supercomputing cluster that cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, or possibly even more than a million pounds. I don't remember the exact price, but it was an expensive machine. I uh, almost accidentally did a denial of service attack on it. Let me walk you through what happened. Hmm. This project provides a bash source me file, but no equivalent for fish? That's annoying. Well, I can probably just port it to fish. Okay, new plan. Source it in bash, then export the resulting environment to fish. Nice, that's all set up and working correctly. I'm gonna be working on this for a while. I'll add this to my fish config to save me running it every time I log in. Now I just need to log out and in again. Hmm. That's taking longer than normal. What? Resource temporarily in the. Hmm. Has someone fork bombing login for? How embarrassing. Wouldn't want to be that guy. Okay, let's try login 5. Huh. They fork bombed this one too. Someone must be having a bad day. <laughs> oh. Wait. Hey, can you do me a favor and try to log into login 4 on the HPC cluster? Would you mind showing me the process tree? stop it. Okay, thanks. I just need to go send an email. Dear IT support, please can you rename slash home slash lex slash dot config slash fish slash config dot fish to something else and please also kill all processes owned by lex on login 4 and login 5. Sorry, lex. <sighs> I'm going for lunch. Anyone want to join me? You're probably wondering what exactly it was that I had done here. I didn't fully understand it at first, but after I had eaten my lunch and the IT tech had fixed my mistake for me, I analyzed the problem and discovered the cause. Now I get to give you all the juicy details, and it includes a curious behavior of fish. That's fish the shell, not fish the animal. Anyway, let's get into the details. We need to start with a little explanation about how a high-performance computing cluster works. The kind of machine I was using is not simply a really big computer. As nice as it would be to have a device that can just run the same programs as your desktop PC, but thousands of times faster, that's not something that's practical to build. This machine, like most other high-performance computers, is actually just lots of small computers all working together. As such, you can't run normal programs on them. Well, actually you can just run a normal program on it, but it won't go any faster. If you want to actually make use of the resources available, then you need to write a program that is specifically designed for cluster computing. There's more to it than just a big pile of small computers. There's a high-speed network joining all the nodes together and joining them to shared storage systems. There's also a software layer on top of all this to make it easy to deploy your program across the network, keep nodes in sync, and return the results to you after a run has completed. This software layer also tries to make sure that everyone that uses the cluster has fair access to it. Anyone can add a job to the queue, and then the software decides when to deploy jobs from the queue to available nodes. Some jobs require lots of nodes, others that don't make such good use of the cluster will only use one or two nodes. Although it was technically possible to bypass this software layer and log into any node you wanted to, this is not how you were supposed to use the computing cluster. The cluster I had access to had hundreds of nodes, but 12 of them were special. These 12 nodes were known as login nodes. The normal workflow is to log in to a login node, queue jobs from that node, and wait for results. Your job will run on the worker nodes once it has been through the queue. It doesn't run on the login node. If you accidentally forgot to use the job submission command to queue your job and just ran it directly on the login node, then you'd probably be using a lot of resources on the login node and thus slowing it down so much that it's hard for other people to use it. This is what you might call a faux pas. This architecture means that lots of people are all queuing jobs from the same 12 machines. I actually wrote a little script that would log into each one in turn and tell me how many users were on each one so that I could choose to log into whichever one had the fewest users. It was quite handy. 
If something was soaking up all resources on all the logging nodes, someone would notice very quickly, and anyone else in the company using the cluster would be prevented from getting work done. We had 12 login nodes. If I remember correctly, they averaged about 50 active user sessions each at any given time. Some of these will be the same user holding multiple sessions open, but this should give you an idea of the number of people you'd disrupt if you took these machines down. So what was it that I had done? I was working on a large project with a very complicated build system that had a lot of different options that were controlled mostly by environment variables. Part of the source code for this project was a source me file that set up these variables according to some configuration files and also to find some functions that could manipulate these variables for choosing different build options. This source me file was designed to work with bash. Bash is the default user shell for most of the popular Linux distributions. However, I prefer to use fish shell. Unfortunately, nobody else had provided a fish version of the source me file, so I had to make my own. The first option for doing this would be to make a copy of the bash version and then manually translate all of the bash syntax into fish syntax. Unfortunately, the file was incredibly large and I didn't want to port all of it manually. Instead, I chose to write a small wrapper around the bash version that would start bash, take a snapshot of the environment, source the source me file, and then take another snapshot. It would then compare these snapshots to find out what the source me file had actually changed and then generate fish code that makes the same changes. This means I don't have to worry about all the complexity of the bash version nor do I need to duplicate all the code and maintain it separately. An important part of the code generation step was to make sure that the contents of the variables was suitably escaped. Imagine I had a variable where the contents looked like this, and I needed to generate some fish code to set that variable properly. I can't just put that string directly in the code because it creates valid code that runs some other program. That's no good, that's a security risk. Fish has a built-in command for escaping strings for use in fish code. It's called string escape, which makes complete sense. I was using a bash script to pass the two environments, diff them, and then generate the code for fish to execute. To escape the strings appropriately, I thought I would use fish's built-in command, since that would be the most reliable way to escape strings properly. My bash code would run fish with the dash c option, which means instead of being an interactive shell, just run this one command and then exit. I tested this out and it worked fine. The changes to the environment from the bash code were replicated in my fish environment. Hooray! I can work on this project from fish now. I no longer have to suffer with bash. This really did work perfectly fine. I was very happy with it. I knew that I was going to be working on this project almost every day for a little while, so I decided it would be useful if this source me file would be sourced automatically every time I logged in. There's an easy way to do that. It's to add the command to the fish config file. This is exactly what I did. This is where I made the first mistake. After changing your shell config, it's normally a good idea to manually start your shell from inside your current session to test that the change is good. If your shell won't start because of a catastrophic error in your config file, then you won't be able to log in and start a new session because your shell program starting and ending is what determines when your session starts and ends. If your shell won't run, you can't log in with SSH. So the best practice is to try running it in your current session and then fix any issues before you log out. I didn't do this. I thought I had already done enough testing I decided to immediately log out and log in again to restart my session and get the new config. I was not able to log in again. So this is the part that I skipped over before. Why exactly was this seemingly harmless configuration change now preventing me from logging in? Well, the first clue is in the error message. What the error told me was that when I tried to log in, some program in the chain of programs that handle my SSH session had tried to use the fork system call, but was unable to do so because Linux had decided that there was not enough resources left to complete the fork. This could happen because the system had run out of memory or because a fork limit was reached. It could be my own personal fork limit or a global fork limit. These login machines are actually fairly capable. They have to reliably handle a lot of user sessions at once. Most people used login one, which typically had somewhere between 100 and 200 active sessions on it. I was on one of the quieter machines, Login 4. I reckon it had around 50 sessions at the time of this event. Login 1 can handle 200 simultaneous connections easily. Login 4 was no different, so with only 50 active sessions at the time, it should have been having an even easier time. Why did it hit a fork limit? The second mistake that I made was assuming that I was not responsible for the system reaching a resource limit. I had assumed that someone else had accidentally run a fork bomb on the login machine. What's a fork bomb? Well, it's a program that repeatedly forks into two copies of itself. After just 10 iterations of this, you've got over a thousand copies of the program. After another 10, you've got more than a million. Long before you get to this stage, you'll start to see that your system is running much slower as the Linux scheduler needs to spend more time keeping track of all the processes that are running. 
Eventually, the process descriptor table becomes full, and so forks start to fail. Some copies of the program will terminate without forking. As they do, this frees up space in the process descriptor table, and some others that haven't forked yet can now fork successfully again. You now have a system that is fully saturated with processes. Most of them are just wasting your CPU time by creating copies of themselves. So the programs you really care about don't get as much CPU time as you'd like. Stopping a fork bomb requires terminating all of the instances of the fork bomb simultaneously. If even one instance remains and it hasn't forked yet, then it's enough to restart the entire attack. Back to the trouble I found myself in. I thought I had encountered the effects of someone else's accidental fork bomb. For this reason, I decided to try logging into a different login node. Once this node also presented the same error, I started to reconsider my initial conclusion. I almost ran the script that I had that would log into each node in sequence and tell me the number of active sessions on each one. This would have resulted in my accidental fork bomb running on every one of the login machines. I remember starting to type the command and thinking, but if it is me that's the problem, this could take down all of the login nodes. I paused for a moment and carefully pressed backspace to erase the command I was about to run. My fear that I was the problem was confirmed when a colleague of mine was able to log in without any issues to the same node that I was trying to log into, and could see the trail of destruction I had left in my wake. I was the problem. I had accidentally written a fork bomb that would automatically run when I tried to log in, and would prevent me from successfully logging in. I couldn't fix the issue, so I had to eat my humble pie and ask an IT admin to fix my mistake for me. The reason why it happened was quite simple. Fish will read and execute its config file before running a command provided to it in the dash c option. So if you have something in your fish config that runs a fish command with fish dash c, well, now whenever fish starts, it's going to start fish and wait for it to finish before it continues. The problem is that new instance of fish will do the same thing. By adding the source me file to the fish config, I had changed the behavior of the source me file. It was now a fork bomb. Well, technically not really, it doesn't expand exponentially like a traditional fork bomb does, it is only linear, but it's still a huge problem. The reason I was not expecting this is because I assumed that the dash c option in fish would behave like the dash c option in bash. Bash will skip loading user config files when dash c is provided. To make fish skip config files, you need to additionally provide the dash uppercase n option. The only thing that stopped this being a catastrophe for any machine that I logged into and the thing that allowed my colleague to log in while my session was floundering was the per user fork limit. Fortunately, the IT department had configured the login nodes to be fairly restrictive with per user fork limits. They could handle one user hitting their limit and still provide a good service to the other users. This meant that the incident had a big impact on me, but almost no impact on anyone else. It's also possible that this was not actually forward thinking and was a reaction to a previous incident, or maybe the OS that they use as a sensible set of defaults. I think it was Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but I can't remember now. I did find it fascinating that all the engineers had access to this by default with zero training on how to use it. You could go and get the training if you wanted to, but mostly people were just told by a colleague, this is how you log in, do this, don't do this, have fun. My incident wasn't even the worst one. Someone accidentally submitted every file on a login machine as a separate job in one command. That had a broader impact than my incident. Anyway, that's my confession about the biggest mistake I ever made with access to a high performance computing cluster. I don't work at that job anymore, but not because of this incident. I continued to work there for a while, then moved on to something else. Thanks for watching. Support me on Patreon or YouTube if you can, it helps me make more videos like this one. Don't forget to gently pet the like button an odd number of times, and if you want to stick around, then press subscribe.